A struggling social worker's life is turned upside down when she unexpectedly inherits $50 million from a great uncle she never knew. Subscribe now to witness this inspiring journey of resilience, transformation, and the power of one woman to change an entire city. Chanel Johnson stared at the letter in disbelief, her hands trembling as she read the words for the tenth time. The thick, cream-colored paper felt heavy in her grip, its weight matching the gravity of its contents. She blinked, hoping that when she opened her eyes again, the surreal message would disappear. But it didn't. Dear Ms. Johnson, the letter began, We regret to inform you of the passing of Mr. Harold Whitmore, your great-uncle. As per his last will and testament, you have been named the sole beneficiary of his estate, valued at approximately $50 million. Chanel's mind reeled. She had never heard of Harold Whitmore, let alone known she had a great uncle by that name. Growing up in the projects of East St. Louis, Illinois, Chanel's family had always struggled to make ends meet. The idea of having a wealthy relative seemed like a cruel joke. As she continued reading, her confusion grew. The letter mentioned conditions attached to the inheritance, but the details were vague. It requested her presence at the law offices of Blackwell Associates in downtown St. Louis for a full briefing on the terms of the will. Chanel's phone buzzed, startling her out of her daze. It was a text from her best friend, Tasha. Girl, where are you at? We're gonna be late for work. Reality came crashing back. Chanel was a 28-year-old social worker, living paycheck to paycheck, trying to make a difference in her community. This letter, this inheritance, it had to be a mistake. She quickly texted Tasha back. Something came up. Cover for me. I'll explain later. As Chanel hurried to get ready, her mind raced with possibilities. If this was real, it could change everything. She could finally fund the community programs she'd been dreaming about, provide resources for families in need, maybe even start that nonprofit she'd always talked about. But a nagging doubt crept in. Why her? And why now? The vague mention of conditions in the letter made her uneasy. Nothing in life came without strings attached, especially not $50 million. An hour later, Chanel found herself in the plush waiting room of Blackwell Associates. The stark contrast between the opulent surroundings and her modest attire made her feel out of place. She noticed the receptionist eyeing her suspiciously, as if questioning her presence in such an establishment. Ms. Mada Johnson, a voice called. Chanel looked up to see a tall, middle-aged white man in an expensive suit. I'm Thomas Blackwell. Please, come in. As she followed him into his office, Chanel couldn't help but notice the subtle changes in the atmosphere. The other lawyers and staff members glanced at her with a mix of curiosity and she couldn't help but feel judgment. It was a look she was all too familiar with. The look that said, You don't belong here. Mr. Blackwell gestured for her to take a seat across from his imposing mahogany desk. On, I understand you must have many questions, Mrs. Johnson. I'll do my best to explain the situation. Chanel leaned forward, her heart pounding. Yes, starting with who exactly was Harold Whitmore, and why did he leave me his fortune? The lawyer's expression turned grave. Mr. Whitmore was your great uncle on your father's side. He... Well, there's no easy way to say this. He was the black sheep of a prominent white family in St. Louis. In his youth, he fell in love with a black woman, your great aunt. His family disowned him, and he was written out of the family history. Chanel felt as if the air had been sucked out of the room. Are you telling me that I'm... Mm? Yes, Mrs. Johnson. You are the descendant of a mixed-race couple that challenged the social norms of their time. Mr. Whitmore never had children of his own, but he kept track of his wife's family line. You are the last living descendant. The revelation hit Chanel like a tidal wave. Her entire understanding of her family history, her identity, was suddenly turned upside down. She struggled to find words. 
But why me? Why now? Mr. Blackwell's eyes softened slightly. Mr. Whitmore believed in righting historical wrongs. He saw this inheritance as a way to address the generational wealth gap caused by systemic racism, but he also knew that such a sudden influx of wealth could be overwhelming. He paused, his gaze turning serious. Which brings us to the conditions of the inheritance. Mr. Whitmore stipulated that you must use a significant portion of the money to benefit the black community in St. Louis. He also required that you work closely with his board of advisors to manage the funds. Chanel's initial excitement began to wane. So, I don't really have control over the money. You do, but with guidance, Mr. Blackwell clarified. Think of it as a partnership. The board will provide advice and connections, but ultimately, the decisions will be yours. As the lawyer continued explaining the details, Chanel's mind wandered. She thought about her parents, both hardworking people who had passed away too soon, never knowing the secret part of their family history. She thought about her community, struggling with poverty, crime, and lack of opportunities. And she thought about the weight of responsibility that had just been placed on her shoulders. Miss Johnson? Mr. Blackwell's voice brought her back to the present. Are you ready to meet the board? Chanel took a deep breath, straightening her posture. She might feel out of place in this world of wealth and privilege, but she was no stranger to challenges. If this inheritance was real, if this opportunity was genuine, she was determined to use it to make a difference. Yes, she said firmly, meeting Mr. Blackwell's gaze. I'm ready. As they stood to leave the office, Mr. Blackwell's phone rang. He glanced at it and frowned. Excuse me, I need to take this. Why don't you head to the conference room? It's just down the hall, third door on the right. Chanel nodded and stepped out into the hallway. As she walked, she overheard snippets of conversation from a nearby office. Can you believe Whitmore left everything to some random black girl? A male voice said, dripping with disdain. Shh, keep your voice down. Another voice hissed. Like it or not, she's our new client. We need to... Chanel's hand froze on the conference room door handle, her heart pounding. She took a deep breath, steeling herself. This was just the beginning, she realized. The real challenge was about to start. Chanel pushed open the conference room door, her face a mask of composure despite the overheard conversation still ringing in her ears. The room fell silent as she entered, all eyes turning to her. Around a large oval table sat five people, three men and two women, all significantly older than Chanel and all white. Ah, Ms. Johnson. A silver-haired man at the head of the table stood, extending his hand. I'm Richard Cavanaugh, chairman of the board. Welcome? Chanel shook his hand firmly, meeting his gaze. Thank you. Mr. Cavanaugh. As introductions were made, Chanel took mental notes. Besides Cavanaugh, there was Elizabeth Thornton, a stern-looking woman in her sixties, James Hartley, a portly man with a perpetual frown, Sarah Livingston, the youngest of the group at perhaps fifty, and George Whitmore, who Chanel learned was Harold's cousin. Please, have a seat. Cavanaugh gestured to an empty chair. As Chanel sat, she couldn't help but notice it was at the opposite end of the table from Kavanaugh. A power play? Perhaps. Now, Ms. Johnson, Kavanaugh began, his tone patronizing. I'm sure this is all quite overwhelming for you. We're here to guide you through this process and ensure Mr. Whitmore's wishes are carried out appropriately. Chanel nodded, keeping her expression neutral. I appreciate that, Mr. Kavanaugh. I'm eager to learn how we can use these resources to benefit the community. James Hartley scoffed. Benefit the community? My dear, do you have any idea how to manage this kind of wealth? Before Chanel could respond, Sarah Livingston cut in. James, please, let's not make assumptions. 
She turned to Chanel with a smile that didn't quite reach her eyes. Miss Johnson, perhaps you could tell us a bit about your background and your ideas for the inheritance. Chanel took a deep breath, pushing down her irritation at Hartley's condescension. I'm a social worker with a master's degree in urban development. I've spent the last six years working in East St. Louis, dealing firsthand with the issues plaguing our communities, poverty, inadequate education, lack of health care, and systemic discrimination. She leaned forward, her passion evident in her voice. I have ideas for comprehensive programs that could make real, lasting change. Early childhood education initiatives, job training programs, community health clinics, affordable housing developments. But these programs need funding and support to become reality. George Whitmore, who had been quiet until now, spoke up. That all sounds very ambitious, but Ms. Johnson, we're talking about millions of dollars here. It requires a certain level of fiscal responsibility. Chanel felt her temper flare. With all due respect, Mr. Whitmore, I'm well aware of the magnitude of this inheritance. But isn't the point to make a significant impact? To address the very issues that have held our communities back for generations. Elizabeth Thornton's eyes narrowed. Your communities, Miss Ev Johnson? I thought we were discussing St. Louis as a whole. The implication wasn't lost on Chanel. She met Thornton's gaze steadily. Go the black communities of St. Louis have been systematically underserved and discriminated against for decades. Addressing these inequalities benefits the entire city. Kavanaugh cleared his throat. While your enthusiasm is admirable, Ms. Johnson, we must ensure that any initiatives align with Mr. Whitmore's vision and are financially sound. Chanel felt frustration building inside her. It was clear that the board saw her as an outsider, someone to be managed rather than a partner in this endeavor. She was about to respond when there was a knock at the door. Mr. Blackwell entered, looking slightly flustered. I apologize for the interruption. Miss Johnson, there's someone here to see you. He says it's urgent. Confused, Chanel excused herself and stepped into the hallway. To her shock, she saw a familiar face. Dr. Marcus Reynolds, her former professor and mentor from graduate school. Dr. Reynolds, what are you doing here? The distinguished black man smiled warmly. Chanel, it's good to see you. I'm here because Harold Whitmore was an old friend of mine. He asked me to be here today, to help you navigate this situation. Chanel's mind reeled. You knew about this. Dr. Reynolds nodded. Harold and I go way back. He wanted to make sure you had someone in your corner who understood both worlds, the one you come from and the one you're stepping into. Relief washed over Chanel. Finally, an ally she could trust. Dr. Reynolds, I don't know what to say. I feel so out of my depth here. He placed a comforting hand on her shoulder. You're more prepared for this than you know, Chanel. Remember all those late nights discussing urban renewal strategies, the research projects on systemic inequality. This is your chance to put those ideas into action on a grand scale. Chanel took a deep breath, feeling her confidence return. You're right. But that board in there, they don't seem to think I'm capable of handling this responsibility. Dr. Reynolds's expression hardened slightly. Unfortunately, that's not surprising. But remember, Harold chose you for a reason. He believed in your potential to make real change. Now, let's go show that board what you're made of. As they re-entered the conference room, Chanel could see the surprise on the board members' faces. Dr. Reynolds introduced himself, explaining his connection to Harold Whitmore and his role as an advisor to Chanel. I believe we were discussing Ms. Johnson's vision for the inheritance, Dr. Reynolds said smoothly, taking a seat next to Chanel. Perhaps we could start by looking at some of the specific proposals she's prepared. Kavanaugh's mouth tightened, but he nodded. Very well. Ms. Johnson, please proceed. With Dr. Reynolds's support, Chanel felt emboldened. 
She launched into a detailed presentation of her ideas, backed by statistics and case studies. She outlined a comprehensive plan for community development, emphasizing transparency, accountability, and measurable outcomes. As she spoke, she could see the board members' expressions changing. Skepticism gave way to grudging respect, and in some cases, genuine interest. Even James Hartley, who had been so dismissive earlier, was leaning forward, engaged in the discussion. By the end of the meeting, the atmosphere in the room had shifted. While there was still tension, there was also a sense of possibility. Kavanaugh cleared his throat. Our Ms. Johnson, I must admit, your proposals are more developed than we anticipated. We'll need time to review them in detail, of course, but I believe we have a solid foundation to work from. As the meeting adjourned, Chanel felt a mix of exhaustion and exhilaration. She had held her own against the board, refusing to be intimidated or dismissed. It was only the first step in what promised to be a long and challenging journey, but she felt ready to face it. Dr. Reynolds pulled her aside as they left the conference room. You did well in there, Chanel. But remember, this is just the beginning. There will be more challenges ahead, more attempts to undermine you or co-opt your vision. Chanel nodded, her expression determined. I know, but I'm not backing down. This is too important. For my community, for the city, and for everyone who's been told they don't belong in spaces like this. As they walked out of the law offices, Chanel's phone buzzed. It was another text from Tasha. Girl, where have you been all day? You better have a good explanation. Chanel couldn't help but laugh. How could she possibly explain everything that had happened? Her entire world had shifted in the span of a few hours. As she stepped out into the bright afternoon sunlight, she took a deep breath. The St. Louis skyline stretched out before her, a city of possibilities and challenges. So, Dr. Reynolds said with a smile, ready to change the world. Chanel grinned back, feeling a surge of determination. More than ready. Let's get to work. Over the next few months, Chanel's life transformed in ways she could never have imagined. The days of struggling to make ends meet as a social worker were replaced by board meetings, strategy sessions, and endless paperwork. She found herself navigating a world of high finance and corporate politics, all while trying to stay true to her vision of community empowerment. One crisp autumn morning, Chanel stood before a dilapidated community center in North St. Louis, surrounded by a small crowd of local residents and media. This was to be the first major project funded by the Whitmore Foundation, which Chanel had established to manage her inheritance. Today, Chanel began, her voice clear and confident. We're not just renovating a building, we're investing in the heart of our community. This center will provide after-school programs, job training, health services, and so much more. It's a step towards the future we all deserve. As she spoke, Chanel couldn't help but notice the mix of hope and skepticism on the faces before her. She understood their wariness. Too many times, their community had been promised change, only to be let down. But Chanel was determined to be different. After the ceremony, as the crowd dispersed, an elderly woman approached Chanel. Her face was etched with the lines of a hard life, but her eyes sparkled with a fierce intensity. Miss Johnson, the woman said, her voice wavering slightly. I'm Ida Mae Thompson. I've lived in this neighborhood for 60 years, seen it go from bad to worse. You really think you can make a difference? Chanel met Ida Mae's gaze steadily. Miss Thompson, I can't promise miracles but I can promise that I'll fight with everything I have to bring resources and opportunities to our community. Will you work with me?" Ida May studied Chanel for a long moment, then nodded slowly. All right, girl. I'll be watching. Don't let us down. As Ida May walked away, Chanel felt the weight of her words. She couldn't afford to fail, not with so many people counting on her. Later that week, 
Chanel found herself in another board meeting at the Whitmore Foundation offices. The sleek, modern boardroom felt a world away from the streets of North St. Gossars, Louis. But Chanel was determined to bridge that gap. The community center project is proceeding on schedule, Chanel reported, pulling up a PowerPoint presentation. We've already had over 200 people sign up for various programs. James Hartley, who had become slightly less antagonistic over the months, but was still a frequent obstacle, frowned. That's all well and good, Miss Howe Johnson, but what about the bottom line? These feel-good projects are eating into our investment returns. Chanel took a deep breath, reminding herself to remain professional. Mr. Hartley, as I've explained before, these aren't feel-good projects. They're strategic investments in human capital. When we provide education, job training, and health care, we're building a stronger workforce and reducing long-term social costs. Sarah Livingston, who had become something of an ally on the board, nodded in agreement. Chanel's right. We need to think long-term here. These programs will pay dividends for generations. As the meeting continued, Chanel found herself once again navigating the delicate balance between her vision for community development and the board's focus on financial metrics. It was a constant struggle, but one she was learning to manage with increasing skill. After the meeting, Chanel was surprised to find George Whitmore waiting for her in the hallway. The elderly man had been mostly quiet during their interactions, often watching Chanel with an inscrutable expression. Ms. Johnson, he said, his voice gruff but not unkind. Do you have a moment? Curious, Chanel nodded and followed him to a small sitting area. George settled into an armchair with a sigh. You know, he began, when Harold told me about his plans for the inheritance. I thought he was crazy, leaving all that money to a stranger, but watching you these past few months, I'm starting to understand why he chose you. Chanel felt a lump form in her throat. Thank you, Mr. Whitmore. That means a lot coming from you. George waved his hand dismissively. Don't thank me yet. You've got a long road ahead, and plenty of people who'd like to see you fail. But I want you to know, Harold would be proud of what you're doing. As George stood to leave, he paused. Oh, and Ms. Johnson, don't let the likes of Hartley push you around. This is your show now. Chanel watched him go, feeling a mix of emotions. It was a reminder of how far she'd come, but also of the responsibility she carried. The next day, Chanel decided to pay a surprise visit to the community center construction site. As she walked through the bustling work area, hard hat in place, she felt a sense of pride at the progress being made. Miss Johnson! A voice called out. Chanel turned to see Miguel Ramirez, the site foreman, hurrying towards her. We weren't expecting you today. Chanel smiled. Just wanted to see how things were going. Miguel? Any issues? Miguel's face fell slightly. Well, now that you mention it, we've been having some problems with supply deliveries. They keep getting delayed or showing up short. Chanel frowned. This was the first she'd heard of any issues. Why wasn't I informed about this? Miguel shifted uncomfortably. We... we were told to keep it quiet, that it was being handled at a higher level. A sinking feeling settled in Chanel's stomach. Who told you that, Miguel? Before Miguel could answer, a sleek black car pulled up to the site. James Hartley stepped out, his face darkening when he saw Chanel... Miss Older Johnson, he said, his tone clipped. I wasn't aware you'd be here today. Chanel crossed her arms, her eyes narrowing. Funny, I was just about to say the same thing to you, Mr. Hartley. Care to explain why I'm just now hearing about supply issues? Hartley's expression tightened. It's a minor logistical problem, nothing for you to worry about. Nothing for me to worry about? Chanel's voice rose slightly. This is my project, Mr. Hart. I should be informed of any and all issues. 
As they faced off, tension crackling in the air, Chanel suddenly realized they had an audience. Workers had stopped what they were doing, watching the confrontation with interest. Among them, Chanel spotted a familiar face, Ida Mae Thompson, watching with sharp eyes. Chanel took a deep breath, forcing herself to calm down. Mr. Hartley, I think we need to have a serious discussion about communication and transparency, but not here. Let's take this back to the office. As they walked towards their respective cars, Chanel caught Ida May's eye. The older woman gave her a small nod of approval. It was a reminder of what was at stake. Not just a construction project, but the trust of an entire community. Driving back to the foundation offices, Chanel's mind raced. She had known there would be challenges, but this felt different. It wasn't just about disagreements over strategy anymore. There were forces at work trying to undermine her, to take control away from her. But as she gripped the steering wheel, Chanel felt a surge of determination. She hadn't come this far to be pushed aside. It was time to take a stand, to show the board and everyone else that she was more than capable of leading this foundation and bringing real change to her community. As she pulled into the parking lot, Chanel saw Dr. Reynolds waiting for her, one look at his face told her he already knew something was wrong. Chanel, he said as she got out of the car, we need to talk. There's more going on here than you realize. Chanel followed Dr. Reynolds into his office, her mind still reeling from the confrontation at the construction site. As they settled into their seats, she could see the concern etched on her mentor's face. What's going on, Dr. V. Reynolds? Chanel asked her voice tight with tension. And how much do you know about these supply issues? Dr. Reynolds sighed heavily. It's worse than just supply problems, Chanel. I've been doing some digging, and it seems that certain members of the board, Hartley in particular, have been actively working to undermine your projects. Chanel felt a surge of anger. Oh, but why? What do they have to gain by sabotaging community development? Control. Dr. Reynolds said simply, your success threatens the status quo. There are powerful interests in the city who benefit from keeping certain communities disenfranchised. Your work challenges that system. As Dr. Reynolds laid out what he'd discovered, backroom deals, manipulated contracts, deliberate delays, Chanel felt a mix of fury and determination growing inside her. She had known there would be resistance, but this level of deceit and manipulation was beyond what she'd imagined. So what do we do? Chanel asked, her voice steady despite the turmoil she felt inside. Dr. Reynolds leaned forward, his eyes intense. We fight back, but we have to be smart about it. We need evidence, allies, and a strategy that they won't see coming. Over the next few weeks, Chanel threw herself into investigation and planning. She worked late into the night, poring over contracts, financial reports, and board meeting minutes. During the day, she continued her community outreach, all while maintaining a facade of business as usual at the foundation. One evening, as Chanel was leaving the community center after a long day of meetings, she nearly collided with a young man rushing out of the building. Oh! I'm sorry, Miss Johnson, the man exclaimed, looking flustered. Chanel recognized him as Jamal Washington, one of the participants in the center's job training program. No worries, Jamal. Is everything okay? You seem upset. Jamal hesitated. Then his words came out in a rush. It's just, I overheard something I don't think I was supposed to. About the program funding being cut. Chanel's heart sank. This was the first she'd heard of any funding cuts. Tell me everything, Jamal. As Jamal recounted the conversation he'd overheard between two board members, Chanel felt a renewed sense of urgency. She couldn't let these underhanded tactics destroy everything they'd worked for. The next board meeting was tense from the moment Chanel walked in. She could feel the eyes on her, some curious, others wary. As the meeting progressed, Chanel bided her time, waiting for the right moment. 
Finally, as James Hartley began to speak about necessary budget adjustments, Chanel made her move. Before we discuss any budget changes, she said, her voice clear and strong, I think we need to address the elephant in the room. She stood, distributing a thick folder to each board member. I've uncovered some disturbing information about how certain members of this board have been operating. The room erupted into chaos as board members flipped through the documents. Chanel had compiled a damning collection of evidence, emails discussing how to sideline her projects, financial records showing misallocation of funds, even transcripts of phone calls where board members plotted to undermine her authority. This is outrageous! Hartley sputtered, his face red with anger. You've been spying on us. Chanel met his gaze steadily. No, Mr. Hartley, I've been doing my job as the head of this foundation, and part of that job is ensuring that we're operating ethically and in line with Harold Whitmore's wishes. Elizabeth Thornton, who had been silent up to this point, spoke up. Miss R. Johnson... While these allegations are serious, I'm not sure what you hope to accomplish by bringing this to the board. We could easily vote to remove you from your position. A small smile played at the corners of Chanel's mouth. You could try, Miss... Thornton? Uh, but I think you'll find that difficult, given that I've already shared this information with the Attorney General's office and several major news outlets. The room fell silent as the implications of her words sank in. Chanel continued, her voice firm but not unkind. I don't want to destroy this foundation or anyone's reputation. What I want is for us to refocus on our true mission, helping the community. So, I'm proposing a restructuring of the board and a recommitment to transparency and ethical practices. As Chanel outlined her plan, she could see the shift in the room. Some board members looked relieved, others resigned. Hartley and his closest allies were furious, but they knew they were cornered. By the end of the meeting, a tentative agreement had been reached. There would be changes to the board composition, increased oversight, and a renewed focus on community-driven projects. It wasn't a complete victory, but it was a significant step in the right direction. As the board members filed out, many still in shock from the day's revelations, Sarah Livingston approached Chanel. That was, a eh, impressive, Sarah said, a note of respect in her voice. I didn't agree with everything you've done, but I can't deny your commitment. If you're open to it, I'd like to work more closely with you moving forward. Chanel nodded, grateful for the olive branch. I'd like that, Sarah. We're going to need all hands on deck to make this work. As Chanel left the foundation offices that evening, she felt a mix of exhaustion and exhilaration. The fight was far from over, but she had taken a stand and held her ground. She had shown that she wasn't just a figurehead or a token appointment. She was a force to be reckoned with. Driving through the city, Chanel found herself heading towards the community center. As she pulled up, she saw a familiar figure sitting on the steps. Ida Mae Thompson. I had a feeling you might show up here tonight. Ida May said as Chanel approached. Chanel sat down next to the older woman, suddenly feeling the weight of the day's events. How did you know? Ida May chuckled. Girl, I've been watching you. I know the look of someone who's just been in a fight. Did you win? I'm not sure if anyone really wins in situations like this, Chanel said thoughtfully. But I think we made progress. Real progress. Ida May nodded her eyes on the community center. You know, when you first showed up talking about change, I didn't believe it. Heard too many promises over the years. But you? You're different. You're actually doing something. Chanel felt a lump form in her throat. I'm trying, Miss uh, Thompson. I really am. I know you are, child, Ida May said softly. And that's why we're all behind you. You keep fighting and will keep supporting you. As they sat there in comfortable silence, watching the sun set over the city, Chanel felt a renewed sense of purpose. The road ahead would be challenging, 
filled with obstacles and setbacks. But she wasn't alone in this fight. She had the support of her community, allies on the board, and her own unwavering determination. Tomorrow would bring new challenges, new battles to fight. But for now, Chanel allowed herself a moment of peace, knowing that she had taken a significant step towards fulfilling the trust that Harold Whitmore had placed in her. She was changing the narrative, not just for herself, but for an entire community that had been overlooked and underestimated for far too long. As the last rays of sunlight faded, Chanel stood, offering a hand to Ida May. Come on, Ms. Thompson, let me give you a ride home. We've got a lot of work to do tomorrow. The following months were a whirlwind of activity for Chanel. The restructuring of the Whitmore Foundation brought both challenges and opportunities. With the old guard largely sidelined, Chanel found herself working with a more diverse and supportive board. However, the increased scrutiny from the media and the public added a new layer of pressure to her work. One crisp spring morning, Chanel stood before a crowd gathered in front of the newly renovated community center. The building, once a symbol of neglect, now gleamed with fresh paint and new windows. A large banner proclaimed, Grand Opening, Whitmore Community Center. Today, Chanel began, her voice strong and clear, we're not just opening a building, we're opening doors of opportunity. This center represents our commitment to education, health care, and economic empowerment for all members of our community. As she spoke, Chanel could see familiar faces in the crowd. Ida Mae Thompson stood front and center, beaming with pride. Jamal Washington, now employed as the center's youth coordinator, stood with a group of excited teenagers. Even some of the construction workers who had built the center were present, including Miguel Ramirez. After the ribbon-cutting ceremony, Chanel made her way through the crowd, shaking hands and chatting with community members. The atmosphere was one of hope and excitement, a far cry from the skepticism she had faced when she first announced her plans. Miss Johnson, a voice called out. Chanel turned to see a young woman approaching, a small child in tow. I just wanted to thank you. The free childcare program here means I can finally go back to school. You're changing lives. Chanel felt a lump in her throat as she knelt down to the child's level. What's your name, sweetie? Zoe, the little girl said shyly. Well, Zoe, Chanel smiled. I can't wait to see all the amazing things you're going to do. Maybe one day you'll be running this place. As the day wore on, Chanel found herself in a quiet corner of the center, taking a moment to absorb everything. Dr. Reynolds approached, a proud smile on his face. You've done good, Chanel, he said, placing a hand on her shoulder. Harold would be proud. Chanel nodded, feeling a mix of emotions. It's a start she said. But there's still so much to do. Dr. Reynolds chuckled. Always looking ahead. That's what makes you great at this. But take a moment to appreciate what you've accomplished. You face down some powerful opposition and come out on top. As if on cue, Chanel's phone buzzed with a news alert. She pulled it out to see a headline. Former Whitmore Foundation board member James Hartley indicted on corruption charges. Speaking of opposition, Chanel murmured, showing the phone to Dr. Reynolds. He read the headline and shook his head. Can't say I'm surprised, but this is good news for us. It validates everything you've been fighting for. The next few weeks saw a flurry of positive press for the Whitmore Foundation. Chanel found herself giving interviews, speaking at conferences, and meeting with city officials. The success of the community center had put her work in the spotlight, and she was determined to use that platform to push for broader changes. One afternoon, as Chanel was leaving a meeting with the mayor, she ran into an unexpected face, Sarah Livingston. Chanel, Sarah greeted her warmly. I was hoping to catch you. Do you have a moment? They found a quiet cafe nearby and settled in with cups of coffee. Sarah looked nervous which was unusual for the normally composed woman. I wanted to apologize, Sarah began, 
For my role in what happened before, I didn't actively work against you like Hartley did, but I didn't do enough to stop it either. Chanel was surprised by the candor. I appreciate that, Sarah, but why tell me this now? Sarah took a deep breath. Because I've been doing a lot of thinking. About privilege? About systemic racism? About my own biases? Watching you work, seeing the impact you're having, it's opened my eyes to a lot of things I was blind to before. As Sarah continued, explaining how she'd been educating herself and rethinking her approach to philanthropy, Chanel felt a glimmer of hope. This was the kind of change she had dreamed of sparking, not just in the community, but in the minds and hearts of those in positions of power. I want to do more, Sarah concluded, to really support your vision. If you'll have me, that is. Chanel reached across the table, squeezing Sarah's hand. Of course, this work requires all of us to grow and change. I'm glad you're on this journey with us. As they parted ways, Chanel felt a renewed sense of purpose. The alliance with Sarah could open new doors, bring new resources to their cause. The next board meeting was a stark contrast to the contentious gatherings of the past. There was a spirit of collaboration, a shared excitement about the Foundation's new direction. As Chanel presented her plans for expanding their programs to other neighborhoods, she was met with enthusiasm and constructive feedback. After the meeting, George Whitmore approached her. The elderly man had been quiet lately, often observing more than participating. Ms. Johnson, he said, his voice gruff but warm, I owe you an apology. When Harold first told me about his plans for the inheritance, I thought he was making a mistake. But you've proven me wrong. You're doing exactly what he hoped you would. Chanel felt a surge of emotion. Thank you, Mr. Whitmore. That means a lot coming from you. George nodded, then reached into his pocket and pulled out an envelope. Harold left this for you. Said to give it to you when the time was right. I think that time is now. With shaking hands, Chanel opened the envelope. Inside was a letter, written in a shaky hand. Dear Chanel, if you're reading this, it means you've taken on the challenge I've set before you, and you're making real change. I knew from the moment I first read about your work that you were the right person for this task. I'm sorry for the burden I've placed on you, and for the opposition you've undoubtedly faced, but I believe in you. Chanel, you have the strength, the vision, and the heart to do what needs to be done. Remember, true change isn't just about buildings or programs. It's about changing hearts and minds. It's about showing people a new way forward. And from what George tells me, that's exactly what you're doing. Keep fighting the good fight, Chanel. The future of our city is in your hands, and I can't think of anyone better suited to shape it. With admiration and gratitude, Harold Whitmore. Chanel wiped away tears as she finished reading. She looked up to thank George, but the old man had quietly slipped away, giving her a moment of privacy. As she left the foundation offices that evening, letter tucked safely in her bag, Chanel felt a profound sense of purpose. Harold Whitmore had seen something in her, had trusted her with his legacy, and she was determined to live up to that trust, to keep pushing for change, no matter the obstacles. The city stretched out before her, a landscape of challenges and possibilities. There was still so much work to do, so many lives to touch, so many systems to change. But for the first time since she'd received that life-changing letter all those months ago, Chanel felt truly ready for the task ahead. She pulled out her phone and dialed a familiar number. Dr. Reynolds, it's Chanel. I've got some ideas I want to run by you. I think it's time we took our work to the next level. As she drove home, plans and possibilities swirling in her mind, Chanel couldn't help but smile. The journey ahead would be challenging, but she was ready. Ready to fight, ready to lead, ready to change the world, one community at a time. Five years had passed since Chanel Johnson first inherited Harold Whitmore's fortune, and the landscape of St. Louis had changed dramatically. The Whitmore Community Center, once a lonely beacon of hope, 
was now one of many such centers spread across the city's underserved neighborhoods. Chanel stood at the window of her office, looking out over a city that was slowly but surely transforming. A knock at the door interrupted her reverie. Come in, she called, turning to see Jamal Washington enter, a wide grin on his face. Ms. Johnson, you're not going to believe this, he said excitedly. Remember that youth entrepreneurship program we started last year? Well, one of our kids just got accepted to a startup incubator in Silicon Valley? Chanel's face lit up with pride. That's fantastic, Jamal. Which one? Zoe Taylor, Jamal replied. You know, the little girl you met at the first community center opening. Not so little anymore. Chanel felt a wave of emotion wash over her. She remembered that day clearly kneeling down to speak to a shy little girl. Now that same girl was off to make her mark on the world. We need to celebrate this, Chanel said decisively. Let's organize a send-off party for Zoe. And make sure to invite her mother. I want to hear how her studies are going. As Jamal left to start the preparations, Chanel's phone buzzed with a text from Dr. Reynolds. Turn on the news, Channel 5. Curious? Chanel flipped on the TV in her office. The anchor was mid-sentence. Sorry, er, we? And in a shocking turn of events, former city councilman James Hartley has been sentenced to 10 years in prison for his role in a widespread corruption scandal. Chanel watched in stunned silence as the report detailed Hartley's fall from grace. It seemed that his attempts to undermine the Whitmore Foundation were just the tip of the iceberg, Years of backroom deals, kickbacks, and misuse of public funds had finally caught up with him. As the news segment ended, Chanel felt a complex mix of emotions. There was a sense of vindication, certainly, but also a twinge of sadness. Hartley's actions had caused real harm to the community, and his downfall was a stark reminder of the systemic issues they were still fighting against. Her contemplation was interrupted by another knock. This time, it was Sarah Livingston who entered, a tablet in hand. Chanel, have you seen the latest impact report? Sarah asked, her eyes shining with excitement. The numbers are incredible. High school graduation rates up 15% in our target neighborhoods. Small business startups increased by 30%, and the community health initiatives have led to a significant decrease in chronic disease rates. Chanel took the tablet scrolling through the data with a growing sense of pride and amazement. These weren't just statistics. They represented real lives changed, real opportunities created. This is amazing, Sarah, Chanel said, her voice thick with emotion. But we can't rest on our laurels. What's next? How do we build on this momentum? Sarah grinned. I was hoping you'd ask that. I've been talking with some contacts in City Hall. There's a growing interest in replicating our model citywide. They want to partner with us on a major urban renewal initiative. Chanel's mind raced with possibilities. A citywide initiative could amplify their impact exponentially, but it would also mean navigating complex political waters and potentially facing opposition from those who benefited from the status quo. It's a big step, Chanel mused. We'll need to be careful not to lose our grassroots connection. The community needs to be at the center of any expansion. Sarah nodded in agreement. Absolutely. That's why I thought we should start by convening a series of town halls. Get input from the community before we even begin formal talks with the city. As they delved into planning, Chanel felt a familiar surge of energy. This was what she lived for. The chance to create real lasting change on a grand scale. Later that afternoon, Chanel made her way to the original Whitmore Community Center for Zoe's send-off party. The place was buzzing with excitement, filled with proud family members, friends, and community leaders. As Chanel entered, she spotted a familiar face in the crowd. Ida Mae Thompson, now well into her 80s but still sharp as ever, waved her over. Well, look at you. Ida May said with a smile. The big shot CEO who still makes time for a neighborhood party. Chanel laughed, giving the older woman a warm hug. 
I wouldn't miss this for the world, Ooh, Mrs. Thompson. Besides, you know this place will always be home. Ida May's expression turned serious. You've done good, child. Real good. This community. It's like night and day from what it was five years ago. People have hope now. Real hope. Before Chanel could respond, a hush fell over the room as Zoe stepped up to a small podium. The once shy little girl had grown into a poised young woman, her eyes bright with excitement and determination. I want to thank everyone who supported me on this journey, Zoe began. My mom, my teachers, Mr. Washington, and especially Miss Johnson and the Whitmore Foundation. Five years ago, I didn't even know what an entrepreneur was. Now, I'm heading to Silicon Valley to launch my own tech startup. As Zoe continued her speech, detailing her plans to create an app that would help low-income families access resources and opportunities, Chanel felt tears welling up in her eyes. This was why she did what she did. This was the future she had dreamed of. A future where talent and determination could flourish, regardless of where you came from. After the party, as the center was quieting down, Chanel found herself alone in the main hall. She walked slowly, running her hand along the walls, remembering the battles fought and won to make this place a reality. A voice startled her from her reverie. It's something, isn't it? Chanel turned to see George Whitmore standing in the doorway. The years had taken their toll on him, but his eyes were as sharp as ever. Mr. Um, oh. Whitmore, Chanel said warmly. I didn't know you were here. George shuffled into the room, leaning heavily on his cane. Couldn't miss this. Wanted to see for myself what you've accomplished. They stood in comfortable silence for a moment, both taking in the space around them. You know, George said finally, Harold and I, we didn't always see eye to eye, especially when it came to, well, matters of race. But he always believed that given the right opportunities, People could rise above their circumstances. Looks like he was right. Chanel nodded, feeling a lump form in her throat. He gave me an incredible opportunity. I just hope I've used it well. George turned to her, his gaze intense. You've done more than that, Ms. Johnson. You've changed the game. And I have a feeling you're just getting started. As George made his way out, Chanel remained in the hall his words echoing in her mind. She thought about the citywide initiative Sarah had mentioned, about Zoe heading off to Silicon Valley, about all the lives touched and changed over the past five years. She pulled out her phone and opened her notes app. At the top of a blank page, she typed, Whitmore Foundation, next five years. As she began to jot down ideas, a familiar fire of determination burned within her. The path ahead would undoubtedly be challenging. There would be setbacks, opposition, and moments of doubt. But Chanel Johnson was ready. Ready to keep fighting. Ready to keep pushing boundaries. Ready to keep changing lives. As she left the community center that evening, Chanel paused on the steps, looking out at the neighborhood. The streets that had once been lined with abandoned buildings now bustled with new businesses. Children played in a park that had once been a vacant lot. In the distance, she could see the lights of downtown St. Louis, a reminder of the work still to be done. Chanel took a deep breath, feeling the weight of responsibility and the thrill of possibility in equal measure. Harold Whitmore had trusted her with his legacy, and she had transformed it into something greater than either of them could have imagined. But this was just the beginning. With a smile on her face and fire in her heart, Chanel Johnson stepped out into the night, ready to write the next chapter in her remarkable journey. The city of Saint Louis, and indeed the world, would never be the same.